Welcome everyone. We are glad to be here with all of you sharing about the Beaker model and some of the learnings through all these years and through the pandemic that make it possible for us to be here sharing with all of you. First of all, we want to acknowledge that we are living that we are working in the traditional territories of Lakwingen people and Shungis nation, and that as guests, we respect and we are grateful for the enduring, the enduring strives of indigenous people to protect the lands and traditions. For that reason, we are grateful. And now please let me introduce you some of the members of Beaker, the Beaker team that are here today with us helping with the presentation. I'm going to start with the, the dessert, the sweet part of the, of the meal in this case, meaning that we are going to start by the last presenter today. And our last presenter is one of the, our clinical interpreters. She is one of the seasoned interpreters that has been working with Beaker for, for quite a long time and with some of us. Thank you, Latifa. The second presenter is going to be Abir Smadi. She is our social worker and the, our volunteer coordinator. And the first presenter is going to be Anna Pavon here speaking to all of you. I'm a clinical counselor and supervisor at Beaker and also working with the rest of the team, Javier, Latifa and others in different projects and representing our organization in, in different platforms. The topic that we are going to share with all of you is focus on sharing a model, a resilient model of care and advocacy working with immigrants and refugees and providing mental health support. This is the, the main aspect and the framework of the work we are doing at Vancouver Island Counseling Center for Immigrants and Refugees since 2015. What is Beaker and who are those people working at Beaker? An aspect that I want to really highlight during our presentation and this overview is that this is an organic model. We are growing, responding to reality. So at the beginning of the model, we didn't have a social package in terms of, or we were doing, contributing with elements of social work and advocacy for sure at the core, but we didn't have a social worker. But then we realized mm -hmm, we really need now a social worker, right? So we need to implement the, the necessary to, for that to happen. So this model is organically evolving and responding to the needs of the population we are serving and the population we belong. Then we will have a, a very short, I, I will share with you a very short case scenario and the uh, Abir will be talking more, more in depth about the social package and, and Latifa about the role of the translators. So please, let's go to the following, who we are. A heart of many colors. Yeah, we are a heart of many colors. Narratives, stories are important to our clients and they are important for, diver for, for our di diverse team, our diverse and multidisciplinary team. And also stories and narratives are important for those who we encounter. The narratives include the idioms of distress, the somatic and psychological symptoms when they collide and they express themselves in, in the narrative that our clients are sharing. But also these narratives mean connection with like-minded like -minded organizations, volunteer people, the stories we are made by stories and narratives. So A Heart of Many Colors is one of these stories important for us. And I'm going to share this story with you because this is not just about, you know, the, the lessons learned 
uh, academically or at is these are this is also about the lessons learned at the heart where there is no separation three years ago a local TV station contacted us uh, to cover the story of Vicar and the work done supporting refugee mental health for Syrian refugees and many others and immigrants in Vancouver Island and beyond. Last July, this journalist contacted uh, Adrian Carter, our director of services and co-founder of the organization, to make a gift. To, to give something to Vicar, something that she felt special. This journalist was doing another news coverage for Habitat of Humanity, and she found a piece uh, of art exhibited. You can see this, the piece here is this door, colorful door with many beautiful heart, with many different faces of people from all over the world. When she saw this piece, she said, she told us that immediately she felt, whoa, this represents what Beaker is striving to do every day. Opening doors, doors of hope with a heart of many colors. And now this is part of one of the most precious narratives we have, we have at our hearts. What does it mean for us to open in doors of hope with a heart of many colors? Striving to learn every day to embrace and welcome and support the resilience of people and the community. And I'm saying striving to learn because we are really a community of learners. And this is something that many times is expressed during our staff meetings. We are making real efforts to, efforts to learn and to cultivate a humble posture of learning to work with this in constant change of reality and the diversity of, of our reality. So a heart of many colors. In many occasions, I say that to my clients. I have to tell you, individuals, couples, sometimes families, entire families. We work with entire families. When they cannot hold their hopes from, for themselves, I sometimes say, I will hold this hope for you for a while until you can do it for yourself. And eventually, and eventually they know when the time comes to hold it for themselves. They say, mm, no, I can't give me back this hope and holding this hope for myself hope for my life, for the, for the future of my family. And now this is an important remark. I have to tell you that with our clients, with the complexity of the issues we are seeing, this is not possible in a 10 sessions model. No. The organization opened its doors in 2015, founded by Adrian Carter and Linda McLean, two experienced counselors, therapists with uh, extensive experience in Canada and abroad. Adrian has traveled the world with doctors without borders, responding to all kinds of humanitarian crises in different continents, and training groups of counselors and translators, interpreters to respond to the mental health needs of traumatized population. And we'll, well, sometime, uh, somehow we are still being part. Uh, I mean, this still being part of, of what we do at Beaker. One of the important Beaker features is that the organization started with no money and with a group of diverse uh, volunteers, a multidisciplinary group of counselors and other volunteers, therapists, master degree, PhD, and trained interpreters to mainly respond to the needs of the Syrian refugee crisis. And here we are, still uh, responding to, to this situation and many others. Here you have some of the members of the team in different situations, a very uh, a fundraising, uh, some fundraising, fundraising endeavors, a training about the therapy therapy group 
uh, training that we delivered in, in Alberta for those working with Jazidi uh, women. And here you have some, some interpreters and, and other members of the staff. I would like to, to give voice to, to other, other colleagues right now. So maybe, Abir, can you please? Hello, everybody. My name is Ana Escalante. I am the office manager at Beaker. I am from Venezuela. And uh, I joined Beaker years ago because I was and I still inspired by the unconditional services we offer to everybody, where the respect, kindness, and understanding are the core values that everybody practices here through their actions. Hi, I'm Michelle. I'm from the Philippines and I'm working as the administrative assistant in Vicar. I used to be a volunteer here at Vicar because I resonate with immigrants and I continue working for them because I want to support a cause that helps understand and value the different cultural background. Hello, everybody. My name is Abir Smadi. I'm the social worker and volunteer coordinator at Vicar. I'm from Jordan, Middle East. Um, I chose to work at Vicar because I consider it a safe haven where everybody belongs and deserves an equal chance. I work with refugees in emergency response and crisis management, so safety is a key for me. Wonderful. So, Vicar mission, values, services, referral process. I have to say that um, one of the, the main challenges that we, we had serving um, uh, the population we are serving it was to, to transition to the online environment in less than 40, 48 hours when the pandemic started. And nevertheless, this didn't alter the, the effectiveness of the work, work uh, strengthen some of the values like cooperation and collaboration and even cooperation and collaboration even more with like-minded organizations and other individuals. We were able to continue providing our services and grow even in those uh, in these circumstances and and we uh, started to, to receive more and more referrals. In fact during the first six months of the pandemic the numbers of referrals and self-referrals doubled. So we continue working with the, with the same uh, group, the same team. Thank you, Abir, for the transition. We continue working with the, with the same resources, the same financial resources, but we had double of, of <laughs> we duplicated the, the work. All of that, I think, are clear signs of the resilience of the model. So yes, our mission is caring, supporting mental health of immigrants, the resilience of individuals, families, couples, and the community. We can really, we cannot divorce the, the reality of the individuals from the community. Because health is, is holistic. I mean, it's, it's affecting the, the relationships, uh, it's affecting the spiritual aspect, it's, it's affecting physical, physical, uh, the physical health. So there is no health without mental health. And we need to be mindful. We cannot segregate, fragmentate uh, health as a concept. A community is like a human body. If one of the parts of the hum your body is in pain, is suffering, the rest of the body will suffer. And I think that during these last days, we see this example and some people even closer than before, right? With all that is happening in, in, in Europe right now. So from this perspective, promoting mental health creates opportunities for enhanced well-being for individuals and for, for communities. And it's a measure of progress in society. And this is part of the framework from where we are working and we learn that this works. Our values. Our values are critical here. Of course, and a spirit of inclusiveness is at the core. We never refuse anyone because um, the person didn't have financial means. Au contraire, we want to eliminate barriers to access these services. So there is a sliding scale. However, um, if the person cannot or a family cannot uh, afford counseling, 
nevertheless, we will be uh, providing services. The same with those who um, may have some uh, problems with their, their documentation process. We, we never say no, or we, we, we can not uh, refuse to support someone knowing that one of the a great deal of stress and anxiety may, may be born precisely in, in the, the lack of, of resources or the lack of documentation, the, the inability to, to work with, with, the, with I mean, the, the situation, the, the, the legal uh, situation can be a, a huge source of, of stress. We cannot say no. Even for those who right now, they may be Canadians, they, but they have been here maybe for 10, 15 years, but they still, they never had the chance to process trauma, deep trauma. We are uh, open to, to support and help. So this is eliminating barriers. This, this element of commitment with advocacy was quite present during, during the pandemic. As I mentioned, this transition. Also, the fact that we developed a, enormous a, skills in order to be able to, to support our clients online. The fact that we couldn't stop them, a, to, a stop our services, knowing that this situation was creating even a, a higher level of degree of, of symptoms a, and flashbacks for those a, suffering PTSD. What we learned is that uh, this uh, online experience for some of them enhanced the, the feelings of safety because safety is paramount, is paramount for us. In this sense, um, we, we really reflected and, and we as counselors, we really reflected and we realized that, right, it's, it's true, we are agents of social change and advocacy because part of this, as, as part of this multicultural and, and social justice. And, and this has been really, really important. So some of the, the counselor, translators, board members uh, of, uh, in our organization are, are immigrants or they have been refugees and advocacy is something uh, common in their lives. It has been there for many years. And uh, it's, it's uh, this life's experience become an, as an asset in order to understand really the, the, the situation, the circumstances, the problem that our, our clients are facing. Because sometimes, I mean, to increase the safety, to create trust, we really need to be tackling topics that are not directly related with trauma. It is impossible. We need to, to really respond to their needs. And maybe their needs are related with housing at this moment. This is their, uh, what they recognize at this present moment with the, as their main source of, stre of stress. And the services need really, these mental health services need to be meaningful for the client in many different ways. Not just learning the language of distress, but also being able to recognize and respond to certain social needs. We have a a, this diverse of uh, ethnically, culturally uh, diverse, uh, spiritually diverse group, in, in terms of gender, age also, and professionally, art therapies, different ways of uh, approach therapy that really create a, a, an amazing source of creativity in order to respond to, to the needs of the clients and also allow us to tailor our approaches. So we have right now 24 counselors, including four pro bono members, four practical students, 20 interpreters, who facilitate communication in more than 19 languages to clients from 74 countries. And is there where, as part of our organic growth, we added to the team uh, the social service uh, worker and volunteer coordinator who is coordinating, I think she will let us know later, uh, around 34 volunteers. We have two office staff, seven clinical uh, supervisors for counselors and interpreters, one consultant psychiatrist, one director, director of communication and grant writer and 
our director of services. And all of that has been pro progressively uh, growing. Teamwork, cooperation, collaboration, partnership, it has been very important during the pandemic. Also, we learned and we were very mindful about the, the, the possibility of burnout, the possibility for vicarious trauma, because I mean, again, we are not just working with this reality. In many cases, part of the staff in our organization, in other organizations, is part of this reality, immigrants, refugees. So listening to these stories could be really a, a source of exhaustion and or even re-traumatization. So we have been also providing uh, workshops and, and training in this area and creating spaces for 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 reflecting more and more on those topics, which now is part of the learning of our organization, not just for others, but also in our own in our own spaces, taking a lot of care for our for our staff, thinking about the the importance of eliminating barriers. One of the main barriers is language, and Beaker, uh, since right away from the beginning, we 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 had interpreters who are trained to work in a clinical setting. And mm, an important aspect is that these uh, interpreters are assigned together with a counselor to work, to work with, a, with, a, in the, with an individual, with a family right away from the beginning until the end of therapy, we are going to have the same counselor or counselors if a team is necessary or the same interpreter of interpreters. This has mm, incredible benef benefits in terms of ensuring safety for the client. Also looking at someone who may be similar to you, which being able to explain what's happening in your own language. We, sometimes people may, may speak English, but when the stress, the, the, the emotionality is, is, when the feelings are so overwhelming, you need your language to be able to express what, what happened. So this barrier is eliminated. Thank you to, to the, the work uh, of our trained uh, in, interpreters. And another important aspect that is also granting the, the resilience of the team as a whole is the role of supervision and the role of, of training. We have seven supervisors. We have a monthly training, if not more sometimes. But this, this is really giving the opportunity to counselors, to translators, volunteers, all the members of the team, the, the, the staff, to, to be able to, to feel heard and to, to share uh, their, their concerns and also how how they, they, may res, may, they may respond to certain situations. So supervision for, for the counselors and for the, for the translators for sure is granted. And this training where everybody in, in this bigger family is, is welcome, helping us to, to really uh, sharpen our skills. With the, another element uh, important uh, working with translators, and Latif is going to talk more about these specificities, is the, the fact that we have briefing and debriefing. We cannot expose uh, our, our interpreters to a situation where they don't feel comfortable. They may resonate with certain things that are shared, or they may know the person. Obviously, we, we need to, yeah, same with the counselor, we need to be very mindful when we re receive the referrals. The referrals need to be, we need to ponder, okay, who is the perfect match? Uh, is it this counselor? Uh, if mm, we have a situation of women who has suffered uh, sexual abuse, obviously we are going to, to, to look for the a women counsel, a counselor and a women um, a translator, right? I mean, this, this could be the, the most obvious thing. There are many other complexities there in order to, to be able to, to help this, this client. The quality of the service in, it depends a great deal uh, on, on this supervision, peer supervision, and also continuous training. And I love the image of the, of the tree because really a tree, for, <laughs> at least for me, is talking about is, is health, is connection. 
is openness, is is respect, is is really the the cooperation, is trust, is flexibility, the flexibility we need to work with with sometimes a, a huge team to support a, an individual or, or family. So these are our um, principal services. Um, counseling, again, we are working with entire families. We realize that we really need to tackle the family as a whole. Sometimes we, we receive a referral and we, we are receiving referrals from schools, ministry, self referrals, many different organizations, are, and are doctors uh, are sending and sending are sending referrals to us. So when we receive a, sometimes an individual, I mean sometimes this individual is the designated ill person in the in the in the family. But we know that we need to to do an intake to the whole family. We know that we need to maybe uh, help other members of the family to be able to to work together to resolve some really deep and traumatic situations. So working with a family, this is part of our learning, not just with the individual. And if this there is not an opportunity to work with, with the whole family, nevertheless, we don't forget this approach. And the multiplicity of approaches, for instance, for working with, with children, uh, we have amazing, uh, an amazing group of colleagues that are, are therapists that we, we realize that these really connect with them. Support groups, parenting, uh, parenting groups in different languages, therapy groups. Right now we are uh, even more realizing of the importance of having to respond to, to crisis, of having more support groups or groups because it's cost effective and it grants mm, the, the support that a group of individuals suffering a collective trauma may need at a certain point. Social services, uh, that is a sixth thing. Of, we are counselors, we are not abdicating of our responsibility and need to, to know how to navigate the system and, and certain situations, but to have a social worker that can help us to find resources or sometimes even to connect with with uh, or to support to manage one of the complex cases is it has been a, a fantastic so we learned that we need this social package uh, associated with the psychological package and the role the important role of the volunteers here providing other other kind of support like kind of a friendship or or helping with language sometimes is is uh, we we therapy needs to stop and again, is we is very difficult. This is not a ten sessions model in very in some occasions, but requires more. But sometimes we need to stop, and there is a need for for some other kind of support. So the role of the volunteers here in collaboration and cooperation with with the social worker and the counselor is very very important. It's paramount. And it's a very creative group of people, or it's, it's really, a, this is a very creative group of people and the volunteers are helping in this regard hugely. So the connection with physician, teachers, support groups, delivering workshops or training in different areas, like for instance, vicarious trauma or, or, or many others is, is something important. Uh, and there we have the supervision of clinicians and also for practical students. I mentioned at the beginning that Vicar is a space for, a, we, we, are, we are a community of learners. This, in fact, is something that in one of the staff meetings, staff meetings where all the members of the team can, volunteers, can participate. And I think that this is an important uh, element that help everybody to feel ownership of the work we are doing and enhance communication and the fluidity of communication and, and gives opportunity for the voices to be heard. In one of these spaces, I remember one of our colleagues saying, wow, we are a community of learners and I want to vindicate that because yes, and cultivating this humble posture of learning is very important. It's one of our learnings, these works. And as I was, I was already saying, I mean, it's not really, it's, it's, it's 
very important to understand that when we are addressing uh, the our clients, uh, the what they perceive of, as their problems and situations that are making them feel uh, distressed and and put, I mean, increasing the this the symptoms, we we realize that we need to eliminate other barriers, right? Sometimes, again, clients' main concern, although there is PTSD, but the client main concern may be related with some school issues, and we need to, to help this, this mom to, to deal with that and help her to navigate certain elements of the system or housing situations, financial constraints. We need to really be able to respond not just from the psychological perspective as counselors. And sometimes we may need to, to write reports or, or have conversations with lawyers because of documentation issues or custody battles, so many aspects. But in this case, the most important thing is that what we are giving to the clients, the mental health services need to be meaningful for the client. The client needs to feel that there is meaning, there is value coming here and I think that this is one of the main aspects that really help to combat stigma. When the client is feeling, and we, we are learning about that, when the client is really feeling, oh yes, it has meaning, what I'm receiving here is, is meaningful, is valuable, they come back. And we can see that the, the increasing number of self-referrals as, as a sign in this, a good sign in this sense. There is something that I, I didn't mention before, but I really want to mention it because I think it's important in one of the values, one of the values uh, that I, I stress was related with peace building. And you may say, wow, well, this is a service for, for mental health. Why peace building? Well, you know, the World Health Organization established mental health promotion as a way to contribute into peace. And the United Nations stresses that the correlation exists between mental health and the construction of a stable and lasting peace. So it is clear and research also shows that without adequate access to mental health services, communities became, become less resilient to political, cultural, economic, uh, social pressures uh, that cause violent conflict. So mental health tools help them to process negative experiences and feel best equipped to, to manage stress levels stress, stress levels and improve the ability to, to make informed decisions. So these, these in, in other worlds help to heal a, a community and, and find solutions in a ways that uh, is, is peaceful. So the work we are doing is connected with peace building too. Tyler, in the interventions, I would like to, to mention regarding this meaning for the client that, that is, is aiming to, to combat sti stigma, that sometimes we really need to be very flexible and, and approach things from different perspectives and give voice to the client. I remember a client from, from an Arabic country from, with a Christian background for her, for this client, mindfulness, grounding exercises. She, she, the, the person was really integrating all of that before going deeper. However, she felt that when she really can connect and relax is listening to some chants, religious, beautiful religious chants. So we incorporated that to, to, to the therapy sessions. And it was great. We, we enjoyed it. And she was really able to trust and, and and concentrate in the work she was doing. For a recently an Afghan client, he he was this client was really upset with, with the news and who know who, who who is not upset with the news, right? So there was a, a work thinking about changing intoxicating ugliness for intoxicating beauty. And through this process the client was able to connect with poetry, with music, with things that help uh, this person to really connect, feel grounded, and, and really, this I found 
so beautiful uh, the way the, the client was creating also finding ways to to change intoxicating ugliness for intoxicating beauty so this this is the these are some of the elements regarding regarding being very mindful about bringing giving services that are really uh, supporting the client connection with value and this is eliminating this uh, helping to reduce stigma can we move to the following please yeah well we we have been talking about some of these barriers like language and we will hear later about latifa the stigma the lack of information about resources and the role the, of counselors and, and working with the social worker and, and volunteers in this regard and other organizations around and other professionals involved in a case the effects of the pandemic shatter the meaningful the meaning of, of safety is true but for some clients also in, increased uh, their their feeling of safety to be able to connect from a place where they feel safe and protected and even uh, some of them they prefer not to go uh, physically to to a place where they can be recognized or or, or seen something that they they don't want to uh, is is preventing them to to feel comfortable asking for for mental health uh, support and we need to mention also the the racism the prejudice discrimination this is one of the things that we tackle we we approach because our racialized clients uh, experience all of that prior to coming here or here in Canada and this is a huge barrier for for feeling safe so we really need to to approach these topics with all the sensitivity and all the care that our clients need well here this is social package and psychological package and I think that I already talked about the <laughs> social psychological one so in brief, we are going to hear from Abir. Very briefly, case scenario. This is a lady with children, a survivor of intimate partner violence. There are some, there is some data here, but yeah, we know the the violence against women, children, is a pandemic within the pandemic. We know that uh, during these uh, years, cases increased, and it's a major public health problem. And for sure, a violation of women's human rights and children's human rights in many cases, right? They are also affected by this violence. It's not happening in a silo. Violence is not happening in a silo. Remember the metaphor about the body, right? If your harm is in your hand, later by later, I mean, you, you will feel it, right? The, the rest of the body may, may feel it. So imagine being trapped by language isolated by a, an abuser this is one of the things that the abuser is going to do is isolating the victim not understanding anything not being able to understand the how to navigate the system mm, trapped literally by by the absence of words where are you going to call asking for help so we are really providing the opportunity to share in their language to and to find uh, sources of information, resources, helping them to navigate these resources. And this cannot be done in 10 sessions. And this required a lot of professionals involved. Counselors, sometimes counselors, because maybe it's the mom, but also the kids, they may need this kind of support. Interpreter or, or interpreters, social worker, police, ministry, lawyers, doctors, in some cases the psychiatric consultant, the school system, maybe housing, some vicar volunteers is a whole team of people working to to respond to this to this reality so we we and we need support to do that because the population we are serving needs this kind of of model that is tackling different issues and, and responding to different needs and that is organic, flexible and can respond in many ways. And we really, we really need to, to be able to eliminate barriers and to continue learning about how to eliminate barriers, but on the basis of a model that 
is already tackling as important aspects like social and, and linguistic and providing this multiplicity of, of approaches to respond and tailor to the needs to the clients. Thank you very much. Abir, is your turn. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Anna, for the amazing overview of uh, our uh, organization. Um, as Anna mentioned, my name is Abir Smoli. I'm uh, the social worker and volunteer coordinator at Vicar. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm going to concentrate on the social work and volunteer coordinator um, as for volunteers aspects of Vicar operations. As Anna mentioned before, Vicar supports immigrants and refugees from all over the world, and it's considered a safe haven for immigrants and refugees who had lived similar experiences in their country of origin and were suffering the impact of trauma. The Vicar model, of course, embodies the multidisciplinary, culturally sensitive, and linguistically appropriate approach, which is, in our case, the word by professional uh, uh, trained professionals. I'm going to share with you a saying that you, Julie, our director of services, Adrienne Carter, used in regards to the social services package and Vicar. She says, usually, the social services package comes before the counseling package. But in Vicar, we started actually the counseling first, followed by the social worker services. This position was created in July 2020 in Vicar. Uh, I was an interpreter uh, with Vicar since September 2019. So uh, I had the chance to be trained as a clinical interpreter and joined many counselors in their session. So when the social services uh, position was created, we were talking um, about the idea of supporting our clients and counselors um, to concentrate more on the therapy plan rather than dealing with the challenges and practical issues that our uh, clients faced on a daily basis. So that's why the so that's why why the social services position workers worker position was created. But the challenge was actually that this position was created following. The beginning of the, the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, um, and it was very hard back then because all of us were working virtually, we're not allowed to leave our houses, working from home. It was very hard to communicate with partners um, or to navigate for other resources in the community as everything was closed. So we had the idea that, that with this position we should create also the volunteers team um, who can support the social worker and help people one-to-one, -one, um, support clients one-to-one -one virtually, and also look for resources in the community to better serve our clients. So this volunteer team, uh, it was created in August 22, uh, 2020, sorry, um, and we started working, I started working with the volunteers in creating plans towards helping the clients that we had back then. Um, with this position of course came many creation of many new systems. We created um, um, a code of ethics that related directly to the volunteers and the way they should uh, communicate uh, with, with clients. We did a full training for our volunteers on what uh, Vicar as an organization offers for our clients. And we tried our best also to communicate in a very clear way with the counselors regarding cases uh, and people uh, that we serve in Vicar. In December, um, we started, as, as we said, with the one-to-one -one support. But in December 2020, we discovered that there's a lot of mutual needs that our clients is uh, asking for and mutual services that they need like um, practicing English language. Many of them, they had, uh, uh, they've had they been challenged by using the English language or they don't know uh, how to navigate the system in the Canadian culture. So we started actually uh, working with people in groups and we created two support groups. One of them is the English language support group, uh, which supports people with the level one and two in English. And the other one is the English Corner, which supports people with better level of English. Uh, the English language support group started with only four participants working with 
um, two volunteers. We concentrated on the uh, um, uh, on the uh, conversational English and situational English, which they can use every day in their daily uh, needs. As for the English corner, it's it concentrated on, on themes, uh, talking about culture, um, uh, talking about resources in Canada, and how to use different things. This is a uh, part of the duties that I do as a social worker. I do support families one-to-one. -one. My kind of support is more into specific uh, challenges like Anna was mentioning, if there's any legal uh, uh, need, legal uh, support for the client that needs or working with settlement agencies regarding a certain cases, housing, uh, if there's any need in support in the education system, employment. So I'd rather like, support the client directly with the need. If there's a, a volunteer connected with this case as well, the volunteer will be seeing the client on a weekly basis and do uh, create like a space for support and different issues, but not for specific uh, challenges. I do also um, help in the reporting of volunteers. Um, I do supervise practicum students. Uh, I coordinate with the volunteer team. I meet with them on a monthly basis also uh, for the updates and for the support for each volunteer. I do maintain contact with a lot of social services agencies and healthcare provider, provider, providers, in, uh, help in navigating the national and international um, law governing the flow of immigrants and refugees into Canada. Uh, I accept the referred clients to um, explore their options and develop action plans for the challenges. Sometimes I accompany clients in person to some services to support them. I do interpretation um, and do a lot of training in that regard. As Anna was mentioning, um, the, the interpreters team in Vicar, they support the, the, the counselor to know better more about the culture of the client. But when we created the, the volunteer team, the idea was is to close the gap and let the, the client know more about the Canadian culture. And it helped a lot having people who support uh, us all the time from that point of view. Um, this is part um, of the things that the volunteers do. As I was saying, they are the culture bridging. They do the culture bridging between the client and the Canadian culture, which is this is their main focus. Uh, they they uh, offer a company and friendship, provide one-to-one -one support, um, uh, sometimes help the client and uh, navigating some of the resources in the community and in the government. Um, of course, I support in that regards a lot as uh, the social worker as well. In 2020, in Vika, we served around 35 clients from the social work aspect. Uh, in 2021, we served around 20 clients. Up to date, we have around 42 partners. Um, and we have, as Anna mentioned, up a total of 34 volunteers today. Our volunteers' backgrounds and experiences varies. Um, we have people who are retired with a long, uh, um, uh, a long experienced, uh, very experienced individuals. And we have current students still now in high schools and, and universities. Uh, we have medical doctors, marketing professionals. Uh, we have teachers, psychology students, child and care youth. Um, currently we are serving 15 clients. Um, this chart shows you what uh, is uh, the model of Vicar. Uh, so migration, because we are serving refugees and migrants, migration is uh, wh where the journey starts. Once they are here, we make sure that we have um, a full uh, safety net for them, starting from uh, our counselors to provide mental health for them. We take in consideration the social services and the social needs, and we make sure that they have the community support all of that is, uh, um, uh, is actually packaged uh, in a very cultural sensitive uh, approach. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna give the floor for Latifa now. Hello, my name is uh, Latifa El Alami. I'm interpreter with Vika and uh, I've been with Vika for almost like two years now. I start on 2020. Uh, I'm an interpreter uh, from Arabic to French and from, uh, from Arabic to English and sometimes from French. So uh, 
our uh, our work is is very uh, important uh, to provide the service at FICA because without interpreters, sometimes you know the work it can't be done. Uh, while shadowing the uh, shadowing the counselor and uh, the client because we are there to have to have that communication between counselor and it's be between uh, the client. Uh, we are trained from the beginning when we get hired and uh, we are trained you know to respect the code of ethic uh, and also uh, the code of uh, protocols how you know the work should be done so the role of interpreter as Vika is a member of a team so it's a key of the process between counseling between counselors and clients the counselors they are providing their service to the clients from different cultural backgrounds and countries. And the need of a team of interpreters from different language is very essential to accomplish this process. I want just to mention that by respect of the code of ethic, we have to be uh, uh, respecting the accuracy of the language. We have to respect confidentiality and uh, respect for the person and uh, accountability and professionalism uh, and we have to continue to be competent because the language is every day changing and sometimes you know you have to know the new words that you know it's uh, that people they are using uh, to show the, the the work that we are doing it's um it's it's based on three important keys First of all, uh, when we get assigned a job to interpret with the client, it should be for the same client since the beginning till the end with the same counselor. That it's, uh, it helps the client to feel comfortable because if he had a different interpreter at every time, for them, it's, it will be a little bit like challenging because they will feel that they have to repeat themselves at every time and they will not feel that stress and that confidence. And that stress and confidence, they are the key to bring, uh, to make the connection between the counselor and the client. Same thing, it's with uh, another key that is really important, is the briefing and the briefing with the counselor. Before we start any case, we have to know the case. So sometimes, like for example, I came from uh, same circumstance that the client came from. So that it could you know, trigger some emotion for me and that it would make me not feel comfortable to be doing my job properly and with professionalism. Uh, same things with the briefing. With the briefing, it gives us, for me and for uh, the counselor, to uh, mention if something's it's been, you know, like uh, been uh, noticed during the session. Uh, like if the client sometimes they they start you know talking for a long time and sometimes you have to stop them to be accurate, you know, with the the interpretation, or they get emotional. So all those things, you know, we share it together and some uh, bar cultural barrier that sometimes, you know, uh, it happens uh, in session. So we need to have that communication to provide the best out of us as a service, as an interpreter and as a counselor for the client. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, every month we have supervision through our uh, trainer that she trained us, you know, as interpreter. And that opportunity monthly, it gives us the chance to share the experience, to share the challenge that we could, you know, uh, that could rise, you know, during our work. And it's really uh, help us to update our knowledge about, uh, you know, interpreting. Because this field, it's specific. It's not like uh, interpreting, you know, in, you know, in clinical, it's not like, if you are in the court or if you are in the office or different setting, so you have to be really very accurate. You have to be very um, um, impartial. You have to be very professional 
Um, because some words, it means something and they should to mean what the person, you know, mean it. So that's why, you know, those sessions for supervision, it helps us to, to share whatever, you know, as interpreter we share together to help uh, to improve our service to the best. So this work, it, it can't be done if we are not sharing it as a team. As I said before, it's, uh, it's for the benefit of the client to provide them the best service that we can. I think whatever I could say, it will not be enough because as a team, the work it should be done with uh, collaboration, with understanding, and with sharing. And all of us, we've been immigrants in Canada, and we know what things you know we went through, and uh, that's why we will try you know to help as much we can our clients. I think uh, uh, if there is any any question, you could have it on the Q and A, and I would be so happy to answer it. Thank you for your listening, and uh, that was uh, my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Latifa, and and Abir. Thank you, Latifa, for bringing this summary of how the interpreters uh, are really acting as cultural bridges and and linguistic bridges for for us. And thank you, Abir, for for explaining the work you do and the support we the, our clients can can receive and the counselors, the rest of the team, for giving the voice to the amazing team of volunteers we have. We have a, also a couple of questions here and I don't know if maybe a beer you want or how, the question is how do you deal with gender issues and do you provide a same gender interpreter for clients? And I, I, I think I, we, we can talk about that, right? I, I mean, I don't want to continue talking. I know that you also have answers for that. It's part of the referral process. So, Abir, would you like to, to say something about that? Or Latifa, would you like to? I'm still like at the end of the, the stress, you know, for the presentation. I hope I, I, um, I embrace everything. Yes. Yes, in fact, we are trying right to know to to under, to okay. respond to this question. I will I will jump into. I mean, what we what we do is that we consult in advance, uh, and and really we 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 don't we are very careful about matching uh, same gender interpreters for for clients in for some in some cultural uh, contexts. This is important not in all the contexts and depending on the issues but uh, for many uh, in many cultures we we know that we we need to use a, a women for women That's and a men for yeah. for men so this is what we are really some in some cases we may be able to use a, to to provide a mm, women mm, interpreter for for working with some men but it again it depends uh, of each one of the cases but yeah, we, we have a pool of interpreters yeah. and counselors that fortunately allow us to, to match uh, genders. So- And this also applies on the volunteers as well, Anna, just to yes. add, uh, it applies on the volunteers. So each case, whatever they need, whatever the client needs is, we do the assessment ahead and um, uh, decide who would be the counselor, the interpreter, and if the volunteer is attached to the case, who will be the volunteer as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. We are very careful and we consult yeah. a lot. <laughs> I mean, about these things. And yes. even once so I had the professionals involved. interpret for a man, mm -hmm. and it wasn't, you know, you know, that's challenging because he was accepting that I could interpret, you know, for him, even if it's a man and I'm a woman, especially uh, coming mm -hmm. from the same culture, uh, same, uh, same uh, religion. So it wasn't, you know, that and that was when I wasn't wearing hijab, so it makes him not feeling that I have to judge him. So sometimes, you know, the look or, you know, the way how you deal with the client, it makes them feel comfortable that you are open, you are not to judgment. And that is really important in our code of ethic, that we know we have to respect persons. And sometimes as an interpreter, you have to show that by your attitude and by your openness. 
Yes, yes. Thank you for that. Also, uh, regarding the referral process, once we receive a referral and, and or call or an email, we um, if the organization or person doesn't know that, doesn't have the form for the referral, we we give it to them. So we process this referral. Uh, the director of services, Adrian Carter, is the person who is going to assign in consultation with uh, maybe some of the counselors or, or and the interpreters uh, who would be the the best match in this case but yeah I mean generally speaking uh, this can be done and and then we need to go to the detail and because we need to ensure safety and that people doesn't feel judged so there are yeah. certain aspects that <laughs> really need to be considered because yeah. culture is yeah. growth right but how people experience culture is quite different depending on the individuals and we pay attention to that yeah. so we have another question will you continue yeah. to provide your services remotely post pandemic or go to some sort of hybrid system what are the costs and benefits this is the one million dollars question yeah. um uh, we still uh, I th yeah. reflecting on that uh, I don't think we have a, I'm saying we because I, I think that the three of we don't have an, a, an answer this is something that needs to be study and the board also of the organization should should consider but it seems that probably is going to be a hybrid system because we realize that we are uh, able to serve right now more clients that again for some of them it enhances their opportunity their their experience of safety and uh, it helps us to be more flexible uh, when, because managing these teams with interpreters and, and all of that is not easy. Some of our interpreters right now are not living in the country, fortunately, yeah. because of the, the technology we can access to them, right? Uh, the schedules also, some of them yeah. are working. So they, we, we need to work in after, you know, uh, work hours to support the the clients so the uh, the online system works in many ways cost and benefits i don't know if any of you wants to share anything in this regard yeah we have um uh, full information about cost in, in particular um in, in our website it was uh, updated actually uh, recently uh so we will find the what kind of benefits and the cost for each um uh, uh, for each segment of clients, it will be there um, uh, and explained uh, in details. Yeah, I, I imagine that also this this question is is uh, connected with the costs and benefits of a yeah. hybrid system, because just when the pandemic started, we got finally just a month before the pandemic, we got a place, a wonderful place for the association in Blanchard Street. We were so, I mean, we are still having the place. We were, but we were so happy. Finally, the the, the space we needed, we, we were in a space before, but yeah. this was already, you know, our space. And we inaugurated the space and there was all the celebration and then the pandemic. And we had the space, but we cannot use it, right? So we realized that uh, uh, there are advantages in both, both uh, in having a hybrid system, so having a, a, a place, but also platforms that are safe, that can be used to, to provide a health, a mental health services and other services associated as, as, uh, as what we are really providing in the organization uh, is, is important. We have been able to do support groups and groups online. And honestly, uh, the experience has been amazing. But right now, we are trained also to respond to some other crises, right? Uh, and we realize that um, it could be useful to have some support in-person groups if the circumstances allow that and with the, the, the due protocols. So, yeah, having people in different, I mean, professionals in different spaces also uh, give us the opportunity to to serve more people, uh, not just in the island, but uh, in other places in Canada. In the past, I mean, we were receiving people from maybe from coming from uh, North Island and, and this family coming every week. It was really uh, painful if I think about that right now, but, but nowadays we can 
uh, support them and transportation has been eliminated. So there are a lot of benefits coming from that. We have another question here. Mm, Michael from, from Edmonton, hello. Have you encountered challenges in connecting with settlement providing organizations, SOPs, SPOs, uh, sorry, in referring clients to your service? In, I ran a pre-employment training for newcomers with disabilities and have faced this challenge myself. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Go on. Yes, yes, actually, because each um, uh, organization they have their own SOPs and mandates, so they serve certain uh, clientele. Um, uh, so from my side, what I try to do when uh, I navigate the resources and try to partner uh, with some of these organizations to make sure that I'm trying to cover as much as possible of um, the needs of the uh, communities that we're serving. Um, so uh, also, um, people, not only people with special needs that I'm facing sometimes, um, the challenges facing, uh, challenging finding some providers for them or service providers, but also people with certain legal uh, status. Sometimes if, uh, uh, if you are a permanent resident or a citizen in Canada, it's different if you're not, if you're um, uh, a temporary resident and it's, it's affecting the services you are getting in the community and by the government and by these service providers. So yes, it was a challenge, but we are trying to learn. It's a process of learning. And um, how I um, respond to such cases, I try to respond case by case basis uh, as a social worker. I also, as I said, have uh, my amazing um, team of volunteers who support in um, research and finding resources um, as much as we can. The pandemic helped us a lot in finding resources outside of our province, which was amazing. Um, uh, because uh, now virtually uh, the clients sometimes can connect with some of these organizations uh, just to know what they can do for them, even if they are outside of the programs, uh, give them ideas, maybe plan with them uh, some, um, uh, some ideas uh, to do some planning and action plan. Um, and that made life easier, uh, I believe so. Yeah, I mean, and I think that uh, this is a, we have such good relationship with with uh, the settlement organizations right and really we we i think that this support has been and this caring has been enhanced during the the pandemic and this is just the reality that we are living and the truth um, I, 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 there is another question here some clients have difficulties accessing online services how were they supported when there were non in no in person services well we were mindful about that right we 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 talk with our clients we transitioned in 48 hours to online services so training the the, the counselors the everybody there trying to understand how to work so but also we we contacted the clients we we learned from them if, about their capacity to to use different devices how this connection was going to to be happening uh, do they have mm, Wi-Fi and is this connection strong enough? What happens if the connection suddenly, you know, stop? How are we going to respond to that? So we really were, uh, we, we have been very, uh, we have been very thorough, thorough in, in, in the understanding of the client situation. Mm, the majority of our clients, uh, ourselves right families abroad they they are connecting with family using already or they were already using different platforms to connect with the family sometimes mostly at the beginning we had uh, the first uh, session uh, or first two sessions were about how to use the online <laughs> and to to help them to feel relaxed some of them, they knew how to do it. Also, it depends on literacy. It depends on, on age and, and how familiar they, they, they are with the um, internet and, and technology. But um, I would say that the overall experience has been very positive. For those who m needed a, maybe online connection or a, a laptop, or even for those who were not safe or at home or those who didn't feel <clears throat> that confidentiality was possible, we were looking for other options, other spaces where they could 
uh, connect, even the office. I mean, we respecting all the due protocols with a minimum number of people in the office. We provided the opportunity for the, the client to come sometimes and use one of the offices and connect with a device uh, provided for us using our internet connection. This was um, another way to support them. Uh, just to add, Anna, also for some of the clients, they were assigned <coughs> to the volunteers. Um, uh, following the protocols that the government uh, issued back then, some of the volunteers, they used to see the clients in person, sometimes in a park, an outside place, you know, maintaining the distance and uh, supporting them on a weekly basis in each session. So um, uh, these people in particular who were not found with the idea of the online, uh, even if they saw the counselor online, we tried for them to see the volunteer in person or, or the opposite. So we tried somehow to accommodate their needs, as Anna was saying, and it was a successful experience from our side. Yes, absolutely. Also, uh, someone asked about the referral process to be careful. Self referrals, calling, sending an email, um, are all associations, organi organizations, other professionals are, are sharing uh, or referring to to be care. So please, the person who is asking, yes, self referral is a possibility, and fortunately we have been able to to work with our clients without a waiting list. And maybe during the, the summertime, we were struggling a little bit, but even the waiting list was maybe two weeks. And for sure, if a case is really, really a situation of crisis, very urgent, I mean, uh, we jump. Anna? <laughs> right. Anna, there yes. is one question that yes. was uh, mentioned on the chat from mm -hmm. one language. She, uh, her name is Marina, Marina Sosas. Uh, she said, sorry, I was not able yes, to lock Yes, I, re I read the language, okay. Latifa, thank you. I was answering to this, this comment in the chat. Thank okay, you for that. That's good. I mean, it's about the self-referral. Yeah. Yes, please, people can self-refer yeah. themselves. themselves. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So thank you, everybody. I mean, we went, I may not be, I mean, passed from, from the... One, I mean, 11.15 that we were told. Thank you for, for being there. Thank you for the work you are already doing. Thank you for striving and trying and for caring. And thank you for being here and for your questions and for those questions that has been not asked. But I mean, we, we will be happy if you want to send an email to, to continue the conversation with you all. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. And I think uh, it was a pleasure talking to you today. Uh, hopefully, we can uh, be partners in the future. Don't don't hesitate to reach out. Definitely. Thank you for all the audience that's been here, and well, please do not that we expose our service in our organization. And if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to join us by email or reach our uh, our website. Thank you again. Yes. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful day.